Welcome back. This week we're going to discuss process analysis. So let me share this. Okay. So the first part is our grammar for the week. So we have commas, semicolons, and colons. Now comma rules are going to be a little bit longer than the others, but I'm going to go over them first. Okay. So obviously we know we use commas to separate words and word groups in a simple series of three or more items. My estate goes to my husband, son, daughter-in-law, and nephew. Now the last comma in that series, this one right here, is called the Oxford comma. And in a simple series, it might seem unnecessary for something like we had coffee, cheese, and crackers and grapes but it can sometimes lead to misunderstandings if we don't have that in there. So for example, if we have, I went to the party with the comedians, Groucho Marx and uh, Bill Hader. If I meant all three people, the comedians, and Groucho Marx and Bill Hader, then at that point, it would be confusing because they are comedians as well. So I could have just used a comma and said the comedia, comedians comma and then represented their two names. So you want to make sure that it's clear what it is you're saying if you're saying three people or two people. So it's always correct to have that last comma there, but it can be sometimes incorrect to not have that comma there. So it's better to use it. We also use a comma to separate two adjectives when the order of the adjectives is interchangeable. So we can say he is a strong, healthy man or a healthy, strong man. We can't say, however, we stayed at an expensive summer resort we can't say summer expensive resorts, so we don't need a comma. In the same way, when you did your description, if you did the crisp, cool air, cool, crisp air, they can be interchanged. But something like the teal blue ocean, you can't do the blue teal ocean, so you have to do teal blue without the comma. You want to make sure that you're using a comma when you're joining two independent clauses, but when they have these connectors, they're called the fanboys. You have for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. You want to make sure that you do not just put a random comma in when you have two independent clauses, because that's where we get our comma splice from. So if everything before the comma can stand alone and makes a complete idea by itself out of the context of the paragraph, and everything after the comma also makes sense, then you need to add that connector that you're trying to use. So he walked all the way home, then he shut the door or something like that. He walked all the way home, yet he shut the door, and he shut the door. Any of those kind of connectors you wanna put with the comma, because the comma by itself will be a comma splice. So you wanna make sure you have that, and we'll talk about semicolons instead of the comma in a few minutes. You also wanna make sure that if the subject doesn't appear in front of the second verb, you don't need a comma. So if where you're planning to put the comma, if everything before it could stand alone and make complete sense, but everything after it would be a fragment, then you don't need the comma there, unless it's an introductory clause, which is what we have here. When you're starting a sentence with the dependent clause, you use a comma after it. If you're not sure about this, let me know. Having finally arrived in town, when in town, we go shopping. If it's clear and brief, it's fine, but you want to make sure that 
everything is clear. That's the whole point of using a comma is to have a brief pause in order to make sure everything is clear. So some of the keywords you're looking for, if, when, any one of the words that ends in ing, any of the words that is a preposition, if you're starting the sentence with those types of words, you're going to use a comma at the end of the phrase. But if you're starting with an independent clause followed by a dependent clause, you don't need it. So if you start, because I love reading, I have lots of books, or I have many books, you would have to do at the end of because I love reading, put that comma in there. But if you have, I have many books because I love reading, then you don't need to put the comma before the because. Because we have our independent clause already there. You don't need to link the two. The because is enough of a link. If you have non-essential words, clauses, and phrases, so if we don't need to know Jill is my sister, we're just saying Jill shut the door but we want to add in there that she's my sister, that's not essential. So we have to say, who is my sister? But if we don't know, if it's not clear, then we want to make sure we put the comma in there. Now, when they occur mid-sentence, they must be enclosed by commas. So we have comma, who is my sister, comma. The man, comma, knowing it was late, comma, hurried home. But you may only need one. So my best friend, Joe, comma, arrived. Usually you wouldn't put a comma before a verb, but in this case, because it's not essential, you can remove, you can put that extra comma in there. But when you have something like this here, the three items a book, a pen, and a paper, you already have your commas in between, you still have to put the comma to separate it from that final part of the sentence. But usually, you will not put a comma between the subject and the verb if you are dealing with essential information. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. If someone or something is sufficiently identified, it's considered non-essential, and it should be surrounded by commas. But if we already know which Freddie is meant, the description is not essential. So in that case, Freddie, who has a limp, was in an auto accident. It's not essential. But if it is essential that we need to know who it is, then you would not separate it by commas. If it's not clear which Freddy was meant, Freddy, who has a limp, was in an auto accident, then you, that would be the only case that you wouldn't use commas. You also use commas after certain words that introduce a sentence, such as well, yes, hello, hi, hey, etc. No, um, why? I can't believe this. So anything that is doing as that you could put an exclamation point instead of the comma, you need a comma for that one word. And sometimes it's just a couple of words, a, a short phrase, like last Saturday, comma, we went to the park. You want to set off Use commas to set up expressions that interrupt the sentence flow. So, nevertheless, after all, by the way, on the other hand, however, so I am, by the way, very nervous about this. It's interrupting the service, the, the sentence flow. In the same case with words like however, nevertheless, therefore, it has to be that you are interrupting your flow of the sentence. So you say, I, however, disagree, then you need the commas on either side. 
if you're not interrupting your sentence and you're trying to link two independent clauses, that's where we use the semicolon before and the comma after. So we'll discuss that in a few. Set off name, nickname, term of endearment. Obviously, when you're doing dates from the month, from the year, then if you would do the city from the state, and that includes if you're doing city, state, country. So if you're doing, um, oh, what's a country? Uh, Canada. Uh, Vancouver, comma, British Columbia, comma, Canada. I believe that's correct. It's correct comma-wise, but I'm not sure geographically if it's correct. But that's what you would do. Usually if someone has senior, junior, something like that in their name, a title that comes after their last name, you would put the comma there. And that could be a degree title as well. So Al Mooney, MD, shows that that's, he has a medical degree. You would put that comma there. Like we said, with direct quotations, if we're going to introduce a direct quotation or going to interrupt a direct quotation, we use commas. If, however, you have a one-word quote, it's fine to just use he said stop. If you have those taglines, you want to put the comma before it or it get just the same way as you would do with he said, I don't care, I don't care, he said. It just separates the quote from the tagline. But if quote functions as subject or object in a sentence, it might not need a comma. And if you have a, a question, say, or an exclamation, then you won't need that comma because the question mark and exclamation point separate and replace the comma in that case. And there are a few other rules that are here that you can look through. But the key thing with commas is remembering to use them for our independent clauses with our connectors. And using them in phrases that start sentences and not overusing them. That's where we get our comma splices in. All right, semicolons. So a semicolon can replace a period if the writer wishes to narrow the gap between two closely linked sentences. Call me tomorrow, you can give me an answer then. In that case, the two ideas are linked to each other so instead of using a comma, because that's not strong enough, because call me tomorrow can stand alone, and you can give me an answer then can stand alone, we put the semicolon there instead. You want to avoid it when you have a dependent clause before an independent clause. So if the same rule applies as with figuring out whether you put a comma, whether you put a semicolon, if the part before the semicolon can stand alone, then you need a, uh, and the part after the semicolon can stand alone, then you can use a semicolon. If the part before cannot stand alone, and the part after can, then you need a comma. If the part before can stand alone, and the part after cannot stand alone, you may or may not need a comma, but you definitely don't need a semicolon. So you want to make sure you connect it that way. Also, if you are having words like however, therefore, or for example, for instance, bring these items, bring any two items can stand alone, semicolon, however, comma, now we have our contrasting, and we're showing that it's a complete sentence, it's not interrupting the flow of the sentence. Sleeping bags and tents are in short supply. The key thing if you use a semicolon and do, for example, for instance, 
such as you have to make sure that there is a verb and a complete idea in that afterwards. If I said how bring any two items, for example, sleeping bags and tents. Now that's a fragment on the side of, on the right side. But if I say, for example, sleeping bags and tents are in short supply, then I've made sure that I have a complete sentence on that side. You also use it to separate items in a series when one or more of the units contains commas. So for example, if we're going to be talking about the conference has people who have come from Moscow, Idaho, Springfield, California, Alamo, Tennessee, and other places as well. We have to have the comma between the city name and the state name, and then we end up putting a comma between the state and the next item. This whole thing is consisting of one item, not each one individually, but the commas make it seem like one from Moscow, one from Idaho, one from Springfield, one from California. But in reality, it's one from Moscow, Idaho, semicolon. One from Springfield, California, semicolon. One from Alamo, Tennessee, semicolon. And other places as well. The final semicolon, rather than a comma, will still go after that last item. So. In this case, where we said that the Oxford comma is optional, but used more often to make sure that there's no ambiguity in the sentence and there's no confusion. When you're working with semicolons, you have to have the final semicolon before the and, so that way you can separate everything properly. And this is, includes all things. So if I put my, my wedding party consisted of my maid of honor, comma, who was my sister, semicolon, my best man, semicolon, and my ring bearer, comma, who was a robot, period. Even though that middle one, my best man, doesn't have a comma in that phrase, because the first one does and the last one does, we still need semicolons. If they are joined by a connector, when one or more commas appears in the first clause. When I finish here, and I will soon, I'll be glad to help you. And that is a promise I will keep. So you can use these connectors with the semicolon, but more often than not, you're going to use a comma with it it's rare that you'll have this many commas in a sentence. If you need to use that many commas, great, use them. I've heard before of people being taught never to use more than one comma in a sentence unless you're doing a list. That's not true. You can use as many commas as are necessary. You just don't wanna to have too many commas that are unnecessary. And you don't wanna capitalize ordinary words after a semicolon. I am here, you are over there. We're not starting a new sentence, we're continuing the old sentence, so we don't need to capitalize. Okay, and our last one is colons. So a colon is means that is to say, or here's what I mean. It should never be used interchangeably with a semicolon because they're used for two different things. So you use a colon to introduce an item or a series of item, items, and you don't capitalize the first item after the colon unless it's a proper noun. So if we're saying, you know what to do, practice. We wanna put our colon in there. You may be required to bring many things, sleeping bags, pans, utensils, and warm clothing. The key thing is you wanna make sure that the items that you're listing, that items or a series of items, is the last part of the sentence. If it's, so in all of these cases, we have the beginning part of the sentence, which contains most of the information, the colon, 
and then the series. You don't want to say, you may be required to bring many things, sleeping bags, pans, utensils, and warm clothing, but there are other things you may have to bring. If we say, but there are other things you may have to bring, now we're continuing the original sentence part and it messes up the whole sentence. So make sure that when you're using a colon, the series or whatever it is you're introducing is the last part of the sentence. A capital letter does not introduce, generally does not introduce a word, phrase, or incomplete sentence following a colon. So if you want to do a idea like he got what he worked for, a promotion, instead of saying he worked for a promotion, you would have to do that colon to do it. But like I said, if you want to, if the verb, avoid using a colon before a list if it directly follows a verb or preposition that would ordinarily need no punctuation in that sentence. So if you say, I want colon, butter, sugar, and flour, it's not a good idea to put that colon in there. It's easier to say, I want butter, sugar, and flour. But if you say, here is what I want, and it's now introducing the idea of a list, then you would do it. But things like including, such as, you don't have to use a colon. You can introduce a list without a colon. It's just that sometimes it sounds better to do so. Or if you're introducing something like a phrase or a word or an incomplete sentence following a colon, in that case, you would want to make sure that you have that colon in there. When listing items one by one, one per line, following a colon, capitalization and ending punctuation are optional when using single words or phrases preceded by letters, numbers, or bullet points. If each is a complete sentence, capitalize the first word and end the sentence with appropriate ending punctuation. So if I have, I want an assistant who can do the following, input data, write reports, complete tax forms. Those are just phrases. I don't have to capitalize them. I don't have to put punctuation. If I put the following are requested, wool sweaters for possible cold weather, wet suits for snorkeling, introductions to local dignitaries. Those are complete sentences, so I capitalize and I have my periods or appropriate punctuation. A colon instead of a semicolon may be used between independent clauses when the second sentence explains, illustrates, paraphrases, or expands on the first sentence. He got what he worked for. He really earned that promotion. If a complete sentence follows a colon, authorities are divided on whether to capitalize the first word. Some writers and others feel like capitalizing a complete sentence is always advisable. Others advise against it. So in this case, we... If what the follows the colon is closely related to what precedes it, there's no need for a capital. But what follows doesn't, then we would capitalize what it said. So he got what he worked for, colon, he really earned that promotion. We would not capitalize because it's related to this previous sentence. We're saying, remember the old saying, be careful what you wish for. This doesn't specifically relate to what we're saying here, so we would capitalize it. And if you're going to be doing a quotation, you can also introduce quotations with colons. And you can do, if it requires two or more complete sentences, and if a quotation contains two or more sentences, we usually introduce with a colon rather than a comma. Now, you can introduce with a comma. It's not wrong to do so. You can do either way. It just depends on what you're doing. For extended quotations, we introduce by a colon. So we'll learn about that when we discuss uh, quotations in research later on. But if you have a, a long quotation, that's going to be more than four lines typed. So this is only two lines. But if this were four lines typed, we need a colon to introduce that quote, and then we'll put it off to the side a little bit and indent it. And that's called a long quote, and we'll discuss those later on when we get to research. 
also you can use a colon following a salutation. So that's the idea with colons and semicolons and commas. Now, you don't have to memorize every single rule by heart. The key thing is knowing these rules helps you to know when to place a comma, when to place a semicolon, when to place a colon. But remembering what I said about commas, if the part before it can stand alone and the part after it can stand alone, then you either need a semicolon or you need a comma and a conjunction. If you have a part where the part before it cannot stand alone and the part after it can, then you need that comma. If you have where the part before it cannot stand alone or, or can stand alone and the part after it cannot stand alone, then it's kind of optional, but it depends on the situation. Like I said, with because, we don't put commas before because in a sentence. Okay, so talking about process analysis. So the purpose is either to be informative or persuasive. So informative could be that uh, thinking down this idea of process analysis. Process is the process of us doing something. So we're writing down the directions on how something is done. Now that could be every single direction so that someone can follow what you're doing. So that's the directional method. Or it could be informational. Here's the general idea of how to do the thing so that way you get information from it. Analysis is where we start analyzing the process that we've just described so that way we can get more information from it. And that can help us because it's good for problem solving. So those are both with informative, but so that could be just to let someone know about a process or so that they could also um, follow along and complete the same process but it can also be for persuasive. So a great example would be if you know that at a job, there's a certain way you do things and you can see a problem with that process. Maybe you use a process analysis essay to explain how the process, this is what the process currently is, this is what's wrong with it. Here is what would do better in that circumstance. Or if you're just, it's still persuasive if you don't have a solution to that problem, but you're saying this is the problem with this process. That's part of where the analysis comes in, where it's good for the problem solving. Now, in your pre writing, we need to know your attitude toward the process. Are you upset with the process? Are you happy with the process? What kind of attitude do you have towards it? Because that's going to come out in your thesis statement. Then we have to think about what steps are important because there are primary steps and there are secondary steps. So we need to make sure we have everything written down that we need. Dangerous or difficult information. This is important to think about because we want to make sure that if there's something that is dangerous or difficult to do, that I get that information as soon as possible rather than at the point that I need it. So, for example, if I'm writing a recipe and I'm intending kids to use it, I would need to say that if it uses the stove or something else electronic that kids may not be able to use yet, I put that disclaimer pretty early on in the recipe of, or in my essay on the process of making that recipe. And I say, this is dangerous. You might need an adult to help you. Also for difficult information. For example, if I'm making a flan, I need to know that when the flan is in the oven baking, if there's too much movement, like banging on the counters or banging on the floor or banging of the oven door, it could cause the flan to collapse in on itself. 
I need to know that before I put it in the oven and start cooking it. Not read that after I've already put it in the oven and destroyed it. So you want to make sure that any dangerous or difficult information that is involved in your process will connect with what you're doing. And then you want to think about your point of view. If you're doing informational analysis, it can be in first person if you're talking about this is what I do, or it could be in third person. So he, she, it, one, those types of pronouns, or a, a person may do this. You would use third person. If you're doing directional, so you're doing it so that someone could follow along with the directions and repeat the same process as you, then you could use second person, you, your, yours, those types of pronouns. This is the only time that it is okay to use second person in a formal essay is when you're doing a directional essay. Otherwise, we do not use you in an essay that is formal. If you're doing it as part of a quote, that is fine. But using it as, say, addressing the reader, we do not do unless it is directional. Okay. So here's two videos that kind of show the... What I mean between difference between directional and informational. So here's a directional one. It doesn't have words, but it still allows us to see what's going on and how to do it. So this one is how to make a paper envelope. And each step that it does expects that we're going to follow that step in order to create a paper envelope. So they fold it in just the right way. Then we need to have that, uh, that direction, if we were writing this, that I then unfold and then fold in the opposite direction. That way I know to unfold. So in the same way that we need to see that you need to fold and then unfold and fold and unfold to get all the folds that you need is the same way in writing you want to think about all of the steps because elsewise if i don't have that step in there about unfolding i'm just going to keep folding things and i'm not going to get an envelope i'm going to get something weird so see again we're not we need to know that you unfold things in order to refold something else. So you get the idea. If we follow along with this video, we would be able to complete the process the same exact way as them and or as close to the same exact way as them. Some of us are better at it than others and we would be able to create that paper envelope. Now here's a case where it's informational. So what I want you to notice with this video, and I'm gonna let this whole video play through, is what parts of the process are actually mentioned and what parts are, not in, are mentioned but they're not in detail and why that might be, and we'll discuss that once the video is over. A dry erase board is a non-permanent surface most commonly used in professional or classroom environments. You simply write on the board with a dry erase marker and use a specialized cloth to wipe away the markings. These effective tools are an easy way to get your message across. Dry erase boards are also known as whiteboards. The boards wipe perfectly clean due to its non-porous surface and the dry erase ink. Dry erase ink contains release agents, which prevent the pigments from permanently adhering to the surface. Green and black dry erase boards can also be used as chalkboards, while gray and low-gloss white double as projection boards. 
The surface material is a porcelain coated steel sheet, flexible enough to be rolled up, but also pressure sensitive. To start, the roll is mounted on a cutting machine. A technician programs the machine to cut the roll to a specific length based on the board's dimensions. Workers verify the length and check that the piece is square. The surface material will be applied to one of seven types of substrate, ranging from cardboard to medium density fiberboard known as MDF. The next step is to cut the large sheet of substrate, in this case MDF, into board sized pieces. Another. Let me make sure y'all can hear the sound. Let's do new share. That's why I thought you can't hear it. All right, I'll start the video over. A dry erase board is a non-permanent surface most commonly used in professional or classroom environments. You simply write on the board with a dry erase marker and use a specialized cloth to wipe away the markings. These effective tools are an easy way to get your message across. Dry erase boards are also known as whiteboards. The boards wipe perfectly clean due to its non-porous surface and the dry erase ink. Dry erase ink contains release agents, which prevent the pigments from permanently adhering to the surface. Green and black dry erase boards can also be used as chalkboards, while gray and low gloss white double as projection boards. The surface material is a porcelain coated steel sheet, flexible enough to be rolled up, but also pressure sensitive. To start, the roll is mounted on a cutting machine. A technician programs the machine to cut the roll to a specific length based on the board's dimensions. Workers verify the length and check that the piece is square. The surface material will be applied to one of seven types of substrate, ranging from cardboard to medium density fiberboard known as MDF. The next step is to cut the large sheet of substrate, in this case MDF, into board size pieces. Another technician enters the length and width into the cutting machine. Once complete, the machine ejects the substrate, which is now cut to the exact size of the board. Next, the substrate is put through a hot glue machine. The machine applies polyurethane adhesive to what will be the back of the dry erase board. Okay. As the substrate... Ex so you get the point just from watching that, that in this case, we're learning about whiteboards because we have an interest on why whiteboards are made or how they're made, that is. And we want to know the steps because we want to know how they're made, but we don't need to know every little detail. So for example, when they talk about the markers that are used, they say that they have chemical release agents that keep the marker from sticking permanently to the board. What we don't know is what specific chemical release agents are used, but we don't need to know that because this is just informational. We're not trying to follow this and make our own whiteboard from at home. So it's in an informational, you might not put every little detail that you would in a descriptional or a directional one. So here's an example is making a cake. If we're going to write an essay about making a cake, there are a few things we need to think about first before we actually start writing. So let me bring up a Word document here. Okay. So the first thing I would need to think about is what items do I need to make a cake? Do I need a cake mix 
or am I doing it from scratch? I need to answer that question. I need to answer the question of what do I need beyond ingredients? And what do I want the final product to look like? Do I want a simple cake or do I want a highly decorated creative cake? Is it a birthday cake or an anniversary cake? Am I putting wording on it? Different things that I might need. So now I decide I'm gonna do a cake mix and I decide I'm going to do a chocolate cake mix. So I need a chocolate cake mix. I need oil, eggs, and usually, water is usually what it would be with that now that's the ingredients that i need to make the cake now i need to think about the frosting am i going to buy homemade uh am i going to make homemade frosting or am i going to buy frosting if i'm making it then i need to make sure that i have powdered sugar and milk and all the ingredients needed to make a uh, homemade frosting. Or I can say frosting, vanilla, and know that's one of the ingredients I need to buy. If I need to buy sprinkles or colored frosting, what am I using for decorations on this cake, depending on what type of cake it is? What do I want it to look like? But beyond those things that you think about buying to make that specific cake, you also have to think about what are you gonna need to make the cake? So we're gonna need a bowl. We're going to need a whisk. We're going to need a cake pan. We're going to need something to spray that cake pan with to make sure the cake doesn't stick to it. So we need these different items to make sure we have everything that we're talking about. And you might not think of every single thing immediately, but that's why in our pre-writing, we start with, here's all the things I can think about that you'll need, that I'm gonna need to list when I get to that point. Then in my essay, in the next part of pre-writing, I can start thinking about the steps that I need to be able to start making a cake. So I can start with, okay, I know step one, I'm going to need to mix cake mix with oil, eggs, and water. Step two, I need to spray the pan. Step three, Preheat the oven. I can leave a note for myself, what degrees. Step four, I can look at pour cake batter into pan. Step five, put pan in oven cook for how long? Again, leave those questions for myself in my pre-writing. Step six, I can start making the frosting or getting frosting and decorations ready. Step seven, take cake out of oven. Now I've just realized, wait a minute, I have this step, but what am I going to take the cake out of the oven with. I haven't said. So I can go back up to my list and add oven mitts that even though we think it's obvious and many houses have them, for someone who might be just starting out, they might not have that item yet. They might need to buy it. For a recipe that a child is going to try when they're first learning to cook, 
they may not think to use oven mitts. So you want to make sure to put that in there. So with oven mitts. Step eight, check if cake is done. Okay, so how am I going to do that? Well, usually I would check with the toothpicks. Well, I didn't put that on, so now I need to add toothpicks to my list. So by doing a general outline of the steps like this and leaving yourself notes and going through the whole process, you can kind of think about what it is you'll need in the ingredients list as well as what you'll need to do in the steps. And if there's any dangerous or difficult information, you'll get to it ahead of time so that way you will know what it is you need. So we could continue on with this, but that's the main idea is we wanna make sure. So pan, when we're doing preheat oven, we could put warning hot, may need adult. We can put these notes while we're doing it. Now the last thing we need to think about is why am I doing this? So that way you can answer, is it because I wanna share the process that I'm doing? So for us, I wanna share my cake recipe because I think it's the best cake recipe I've ever found. Or for example, I have to be gluten-free, so I cannot use a regular cake mix. Therefore, if I wanna make something like angel food cake, I have to make it from scratch. So finding a recipe that is really good that I wanna share with people so that they, who are also have celiac disease or gluten intolerances can have angel food cake as well, I would wanna share that recipe. So maybe it's the best one I've found for that case, or maybe it's a family heirloom recipe or something like that. I want to have my attitude figured out as well as why I'm doing this so that way I can understand why am I sharing it that I might be able to share some of that information in the introduction and why or, or what attitude do I have towards the process. So it's pretty positive towards this process. Whereas if I were writing a job for, for a job and saying this is the process that we do there's a problem with it, now you know that my attitude towards it is there's a problem with this process and we need to fix it. Okay. While you're drafting, the key thing is to break it down into sections. So where we had on our part here to start expanding our list, we would look at the fact that this would be one whole section. So that might be your first body paragraph where you describe about buying ingredients and gathering the materials that you need. The first steps of making a cake might be the second idea that we're doing. If we're making frosting, that might be a third paragraph. Once the cake is done and talking about frosting and decorating, that might be a paragraph by itself cross cake. So we want to break it into sections while we're drafting so that way it's clear what it is that we're doing and it's understandable. If we're doing an analysis, we want to make sure we have a section that has the process described and then a section that has the analysis described. And you don't have to label these sections like ingredients or anything like that. You can just use normal sentences because you're writing an essay. So you have to think of when you're doing a process essay, you're still going to do that process essay in the point of view of, in the point of view of writing an essay. So you still want to make sure that you're doing what you have to do to write an essay. You're still having complete sentences. You're still writing things out. When you have that analysis, you wanna answer questions like, why was the strategy unwise? How could it have been better handled? What can we do? How is something done? And those are some keywords to look for if you're 
analyzing a process. So your thesis should, while you're drafting, should indicate your outcome, the purpose, and your attitude toward that process. So the outcome in our cake example is I'm going to have a cake. So here's a recipe for my grandmother's best chocolate cake. Now I've described my outcome. I'm going to have a chocolate cake. My purpose to share. It's uh, factual to inform about the process. And I have my attitude that it's my grandmother's best recipe for a chocolate cake. If it's a persuasive one that I wanted to say, so this process that we're doing currently is inefficient and can be improved upon. Now I've said that this process, I'm being persuasive. My, the outcome is to show you a better version of the process or to have you believe at least the same way I do that the process is inefficient. If I don't have a solution yet, my purpose is to persuade and my attitude towards that process is clear. The introduction paragraph is going to describe introducing the recipe or the process that it is you're describing. The conclusion is where you discuss the outcome. So now that you reason, especially if you're doing a directional essay, what outcome should your audience expect at the end of the process? Were there other methods of the process that someone might use? Discuss why yours is the best method in order to do it. So for example, in knitting, there's a European style of knitting and there's an American style of knitting. And it depends on which hand you use while you're knitting. So American style uses the right hand to throw the yarn around the needle. Let European style uses the left hand to wrap the yarn around the needle as you're working with the two needles. If I wanted to say I've done this for during the outcome knitting project, here's the outcome. Another method to do is American throw knitting. Mine is the best because of using the European method because I'm also a crocheter and it's a lot easier to knit when you come from crocheting if you use the European method. So I've explained why mine is the best method for me at least, but I've also said, excuse me, why there are other methods. Now, sometimes you have to illustrate a process with words because there are parts that are not clear. So for example, is we have a few pictures here of the first time I welded and or learned to weld and made a piece for my husband's car that we talked about last week. I made the license plate bracket for it. And if I'm writing an essay about that process, I need to make sure that there are parts that are clear. So for example, one of the reasons I'm proud of this is because I had one really, really good weld. Now, if you've never done welding before, or your audience may never have done welding before, you need to let them know that a good weld looks like a stack of coins that's been knocked over. So I need to use those descriptive words, that, that description process with my process form in order to show my audience what I'm talking about not just tell them, well, it was a good weld. Well, how do we know it was a good weld? Well, because it looked like a stack of coins knocked over. The blue flame is what it looks like when you're looking at it, but when you're looking at it through the helmet, it looks a little bit different. Different parts of that process, you may need to illustrate with your words a little bit more for your audience if they don't know what it is that you're going to be doing. 
that could be for recipes as well. That could be for any type of process. There might be something that is so specific to your culture or to the process that you're describing that you need to make sure you have what you need finished. Okay. When you're revising and editing, this is where we want to make sure that we're looking at the order such as chronological. So there's only going to be one order in this case if you're doing directional because you want to say here is one direction, here's the next step, and say it in chronological order so that way people get whatever it is out of the process that you want them to get. And in informational, you still want it to be chronological because you're describing the process so that way you can give information on it or persuade someone about it. So chronological is really the only order we're going to need. So you want to make sure that each step is in the right order. You want to make sure that you have transitions. So words like next, then, after this, before that. You want to make sure you have those transitions in there so that way it's clear how we get from one step to the next. You don't want to just, in an essay format, list step one, step two, step three, step four because we want actual paragraphs rather than a list. You also wanna make sure that all steps are accounted for, even the minor ones, because like I said, for someone who's never done it before, which is ideally who we want uh, repeating our process, they are not going to know the same thing as you. So for example, if I'm learning if I'm doing a math problem, say, and I'm doing long division, and I do the division out, and I add the numbers or subtract the numbers in my head and keep going with the long division problem, and I don't actually write out the subtraction on paper, in that case, I don't need to because I'm the only one doing it and I'm good. It, without writing it down. I still know where I'm at. But for someone who's learning how to do long division, they would need to have that step written down so that way you can make sure it's clear what's happening during the process. And you need to think about any variables that need to be accounted for. So thinking about as many as you can is the key. It doesn't mean that you will be able to think about every single variable because there's many, 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 many variables sometimes that we can't control for. We can't control for if the oven breaks, what do we do? We can't control for what do you do if you burn yourself? You, some of these things you can't control for, but you can try to think about the variables that are most likely to happen while repeating that process and try to keep it, make sure that you've put them in to the essay so that way people know what to expect. So for example, in class, I would have you do a practice with pets. Now that would be thinking about first, if we were writing to talk about how to take care of a pet, well, we would need to talk about food, we would need to talk about training, we need to think about what type of pet it is. We would need to think about lots of different variables, um, the individuality of the cat or dog or whatever animal it is that we're doing. We would need to think about all of that. And you would think about what are the steps of learning to take care of a pet. And then we would go into, now if you're writing an essay, not just of, learning the steps to take care of a pet, but how to teach a child to take care of a pet. Now there's a little bit more difficulty with it. There's other variables we have to think of because things like telling the child that the animal has feelings and may not always want to be touched. An adult will get that. You don't have to write that down in an essay geared towards adults. But at an audience of children, you would need to explain things like life and death, that that goldfish that you got two days ago 
yes, it might die because goldfish don't live very long, but this eventually, this is what's going to happen to the animal. Now, you don't need to tell them the minute they get the animal, obviously, but you need to think about certain variables on what you might need to teach the child. You might need to teach the child not to eat the food out of the animal's dish because they might realize it's not food for humans. So there are different steps that you need to do depending on who your audience is, depending on what your purpose is, and you want to think about those different steps and how it's slightly different between writing an essay on how to take care of pets for an adult versus how to take care of pets for a child. So that would be our practice. So that is process analysis. And this will be your first big essay for the class. And all of the instructions are posted on Canvas for you. Your rough draft will be due at the end of this week. And then next week, we're going to do peer review. So in order to do that, you're going to post your essay to the discussion board. You can either copy and paste the essay and post it in the discussion board, or you can use the upload a link and um, either upload a link if you have in Google Docs or upload a file of your essay. And you, after you've uploaded your essay in some format, are then going to go back through the discussion board and find two other students' essays. And you're gonna read through them and make comments. And I've posted the questions for peer review for the week after next, when we actually do the peer review, or next week, I guess, not the week after next, the next week when we do peer review, there will be questions that you will answer and try to help each other out with that process. So it gives you that second set of eyes that is reading your paper to give you some advice before you go on to finish your essay. All right, I'll see you all next week.